Try to breathe comfortably. Notice where the breathing is most prominent in the body. And focus your attention there. Try to make that spot comfortable. And then see how far the sense of comfort can spread. You're going to need this as your foundation. Because it's inevitable that when you're sitting and meditating, especially for a long time, the pains will come up. And if you're going to deal with them properly, you need to have a foundation of well-being. It gives you a sense of confidence that the pain is not going to take over. It's not going to overwhelm you. Because you found some allies inside the parts of the body you can make comfortable. And at the very least, you can always go there. But that's just hiding out. Now, sometimes hiding out is all you can do. But it doesn't solve the problem. Because the mind can create a lot of suffering around physical pain. And you want to understand why. And it's not simply because we think about it and talk to ourselves about it. It's because we think about it and talk to ourselves in the wrong way. And if the problem of pain could be ended simply by not thinking, we'd all go into that state of non-perception. That would be it. But there's a state of non-perception that's actually wrong concentration. No discernment gets developed there. Remember, the path requires not only right concentration, but also discernment, right view. Which means you have to learn how to talk to yourself in new ways, develop new types of perceptions. First, you want to see what the perceptions are that you have around the pain. How do you talk to yourself about it? If you find yourself talking about how long it's been there and how much longer it's going to be to the end of the hour, Remind yourself that all you need is to be in the present moment. And if you add the past and the future, that's weighing the present moment down. But even being in the present moment, there can still be perceptions that make the pain hard to bear. So you want to question them. And John Mahabhu has a lot of really good questions. Say there's a pain in your knee or a pain in your pain in your hip. Is the pain the same thing as the knee? Is it the same thing as the hip? They're in the same place, but are they the same thing? Look into it. It is possible for them to be in the same place, but not be the same thing. After all, the the hip is part of the physical body, made out of the four elements. The pain is not any of those four elements, something else. You may say that it's like a light that's on a piece of ground. The light is one thing, the ground is something else. And if that's something in the mind insists that what they are the same thing, question it. You can ask yourself, what shape does the pain have? It may seem like a strange question, but there may be part of the mind that has a perception that it does have a shape and is trying to control it, trying to keep it within certain boundaries so it doesn't spread, building up a little wall of tension around it, which actually doesn't help the problem. You can ask if the pain has an intention to hurt you. Part of the mind will say, well, of course not. But there may be a part of the mind that says, well, it seems like it. The only way you're going to find that second part of the mind is to ask questions. You can ask if the pain is coming at you. Actually, the pain doesn't have a direction. If you're going to give it a direction, make it go away. In other words, as soon as it arises, remind yourself, as soon as it appears, it's going away, because the pain comes in little moments. The perception that it's one long, continuous pain, that's a perception you should question as well. 
and you question it by trying alternative perceptions. You don't stop thinking. You think in new ways. You can think of yourself at the back end of a train. This train's going through the countryside. You're facing backwards, and anything that appears in your range of vision is already going away from you. Have that same relationship to the pain. See what that does. In other words, you have to think in new ways. It's not simply a matter of stopping your thinking. There's a great passage in one of Ajahn Buddha's Dharma conversations where he's talking to someone about issues of self, not self. And the literal meaning of one of his statements is to consider, but with a tone of voice and in the context. He's basically saying, use your brains. Think about these things. If the problem of suffering could be solved by not thinking, then why do we have so many books and books and books in the Pali Canon? All that Dharma that the Buddha explains the problem, uses to explain the problem of suffering. It's because suffering is so many implications, so many ramifications. And you've got to learn how to think your way around all the different ways that the mind can very unskillfully create a lot of suffering for itself. And you do that by reversing the thoughts, changing the thoughts around, turning them inside out, trying new ways of thinking. So we get the mind still, not because it's going to solve the problem in and of itself. We get it still so that it can do the work, see things clearly. If you want to see the, what the mind is doing in the present moment, you've got to get it still. If you're trying to analyze the mind while it's running around, all you get are blurs. Everything is in the dark. And all the tools of the mind, your perceptions, your thought constructs, they're getting used in the dark, too. Imagine if you were using power tools in the dark. Couldn't see what you were doing. You could do a lot of damage. What you're trying to do is bring some light to what you're doing. See precisely what are the perceptions you have around the pain. And ask yourself, are you using the tools of perception skillfully or are you using them sloppily? Because you've got to look at the details. When you read Dharma books, you get the basic principles. You listen to Dharma talks, you get the basic principles. But you've got to look at the details of your own ways of creating suffering, if you want to understand things. Then you have to come up with precise alternatives, different ways of thinking about suffering, different ways of thinking about the pain, or whatever the issue is that's got the mind worked up. So it's not a question of not thinking, it's a question of thinking in new ways. Thinking with the lights on. So you can see the details of what you're doing. And you can use your tools well. Now there will come a point where you see things so clearly that you can put the tools down. When you've thoroughly understood how your perceptions were causing suffering, and you've developed a path of perceptions and thought constructs to counteract them. Because that basically is what right view is all about, discernment is all about. What is your discernment going to use if not your perceptions and your thought constructs? What else does it have? You use aggregates to solve the problem of the aggregates, of clinging to the aggregates. When the work is done, then you can put the tools down. But you've got to use the tools. Because there's a lot of ignorance that has to be counteracted. And the best way to dig it out is to try thinking in new ways. Like that issue of the shape of the pain. There may be a subconscious 
attitude that it does have a shape. As long as you don't question it, it's going to stay subconscious. But when you start questioning it, then you run into it. The order of questions made out of directed thought, evaluation, perceptions, thought constructs. Active thinking. So you use thinking to cure thinking. That's the role of discernment on the path. If you let go simply because you've heard that if you don't create narratives around the pain, then it's going to be better. So you stop the narrative. Well, that's mindfulness. But if you look more deeply into exactly what are the perceptions that still make it painful and suffering, even when you're just in the present moment, that's when you begin to get in, into the area of discernment. As the Buddha said, mindfulness holds things in check. Discernment is what cuts through them. You can hold things in check only for so long. But when something is cut, it's cut for good. It's like cutting off your arm. You can try sewing it back on, but it's not going to be the same as it was before. If you just hold the arm in check, say you wrap something around it, you can very easily unwrap it and still use the arm as you used it before. But if you want to totally let go of it, you cut through it. It's not a pretty image, but it does give you the sense that mindfulness is just there to hold things in check for a while, whereas the activity of discernment is required if you really want to comprehend the suffering. And only then can you abandon the cause, because you're coming from understanding, from seeing clearly what you're doing, having counteracted all the unskillful thoughts in the mind, so you can get them up into the conscious level of your awareness, and then you can let them go in an entirely different way. So think. As the Buddha said, commit yourself to the practice and then reflect on what you're doing. The reflection is going to require using perceptions and using thought constructs. And it's learning how to use them well that you can finally put them down. It's in using them well that you really understand them. And the letting go that comes from mindfulness when you simply do as you're told, let go. And the letting go that comes from seeing that this is not really worth it, and you see clearly that it's not really worth it. Those are two very different things. The second requires your active thinking abilities. So keep them sharp. Thinking may be part of the problem, but it's also going to be the solution. <laughs>